Jonathan Wolfe thinking out loud. Statesman and political thinker Thomas More was proclaimed patron saint of politicians in October 2000. Before that, presumably, they had to rely on their own reserves. But let us hope he's able to bring some comfort to those most in need, those who doggedly pursue their own policies, even in the face of concerted public opposition. But is it even legitimate for a politician to remain in power without popular support? This was debated at length by two of the founding fathers of the US Constitution, Alexander Hamilton and James Madison. One view is that politicians are merely delegates with a duty to carry out the will of those who elected them. The alternative view is that there are representatives with a duty to filter public opinion in order to carry out the common good. Sometimes they are bound to take unpopular decisions. Both views have problems. A politician has to be more than a delegate, having the time, experience, sometimes even ability to absorb and respond to far more information than the ordinary citizen. A politician must be able to exercise judgment. The great majority of the British public is said to want to return to capital punishment. The great majority of MPs feel duty bound to ignore them. No politician can afford to override public opinion. In a democracy, they are voted in and voted out. In fact, a politician's fear of losing office may well be the people's most potent democratic weapon. However expert, a politician who fails to recapture popular support simply won't survive. We should all remember Enoch Powell's remark that every political career ends in failure or, as St. Thomas More could tell us, worse. Jonathan Wolfe. Later we'll have our cartoon. <laughs> If only it was as easy to export democracy as it is other parts of the American dream. In this global market, the same products are available from Bogner to Baghdad, if you've got the right money. But is there a global market in politics? Can we sell bits of liberalism to Iraq? Chili dog, please. Now when saints go marching by, Whatever the true aims of this war, you can't bomb a country into democracy. Food parcels and medicine won't get it there either. What matters is how people feel and think about each other. Swiss French prophet of democracy, Jean-Jacques Rousseau, knew this. Stability, he argued, begins with a nation bound together by common ties and history. <laughs> But in the modern world of so many choices, we can't rely on everyone being alike. As Harvard philosopher John Rawls pointed out, contemporary societies pulse with diversity, different religions, values, cultures. Trees of green, red roses too. Then how do we get to democracy? Not from the short order menu. The people themselves must want to work for it. Democracy needs deep roots. Not just new laws, new buildings, but a society in which people are prepared to justify their actions to their fellow citizens. A desire for legitimacy must replace the naked struggle for power. What a wonderful world. But no magic pill or whiz-bang new technology can cure ignorance, hostility, mutual suspicion. We don't know whether ideas of reason and justification will ever corner the global market, but it's hard to think of anything better that we have to offer. What a wonderful Joe 
warfare and now, considers war whether social justice is compatible with economic efficiency. <laughs> You're working late, and there's that awkward moment when you come face to face with the person who clears up after you. And it gets worse when you reflect on the justice of how much money you each take home. The government seems to share this concern. The words social justice are on everybody's lips. This is a dramatic change. Margaret Thatcher's favorite economist, Austrian Frederick von Hayek, argued that social justice is a wicked mirage Aim for justice, get a shattered economy. But now, social justice is back in town. Gordon Brown, in particular, draws on the ideas of American political philosopher John Rawls. Rawls asks you to imagine how you would like society to be if you didn't know your role in it. If you didn't know whether you were the cleaner or the city suit, how would you arrange things? Rawls thinks we would have special concern for those at the bottom of the heap. So social justice means doing our best for the worst off. But Hayek argued that meddling in the economy, jealously taking from the rich to give to the poor, is a dangerous game. It destroys the profit motive, depriving the market of its lifeblood of risk and innovation. Rawls answers that social justice means help the poor, not bleed the rich. Intelligent policy tolerates inequalities to preserve incentives, spreading wealth and opportunity. So, in a just society, every job has a decent wage and every person a fair chance of being banker or cleaner. According to Rawls, governments can harness talent, even greed, to the benefit of everyone. If he's right, we can all go home happy. Joe Wolf. And now our resident philosopher, Joe Wolf, has been turning his mind to whether endless economic growth is really good for us. This may look like fun, but in fact, I'm doing something very serious. My patriotic duty of spending money. By splashing out here on Brighton Pier, I'm doing my bit to keep the economy going, boosting GDP. Gross domestic product measures economic activity, what we earn, what we spend. But here's a funny thing. Even the economists who first devised the idea in the 1930s warned that it doesn't tell us much about real prosperity. First of all, GDP includes all economic activity. So money spent on crime prevention or clearing up oil spills counts just as much as money spent enjoying yourself. Also, some growth is an illusion. Suppose you start paying someone to look after your children, and they pay you to look after their parents. GDP grows, but perhaps no one feels any better off. Karl Marx predicted that capitalism will increasingly commodify our world. Things that were once done out of love or friendship become economic transactions. GDP marches on, leaving us behind. An American group, Redefining Progress, has got GDP in its sights. They point out that the hero of GDP is someone going through a costly divorce while receiving expensive medical treatment. <laughs> Instead, inspired by English romantic John Ruskin, they've defined the GPI, the Genuine Progress Indicator. Activity is counted as positive if it does us good, and negative if it does us harm. By their standards, we've been in decline for the last 30 years. And what of the future? Can we predict that any government will come to think this way? Unlikely. In the meantime, as we pay each other to destroy the planet, we can console ourselves that at least we're boosting GDP. Well, that is it for this week and for this political year. We'll